Welcome to episode 76 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag for our Thanksgiving edition. Let's get started with my first topic. And news broke today around Ericsson's intention to acquire Vonage. And the first question that came to my mind is like, what does this really mean for their push into enterprise? And as I dug into uh, the, 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 the details around the acquisition, so it's, it's a pretty big acquisition for Ericsson, over $6 billion, which represents about a four times multiple on uh, top line revenue. And I find it interesting when I, when I think of Vonage, I think of unified communications as a service, but as I sort of dug into this, they also offer a video communications platform and they boast that they have over 120,000 customers and more than a million developers globally. And so if you think about this, what Vonage positions with VCP is, it provides a framework that allows developers to embed high quality um, communications, especially video, um, into applications without any necessary incremental infrastructure on the back end. So if you think about 5G and what it promises from a latency perspective, it's really going to be fine-tuned for, for video. And so it's, it's quite a costly price tag for Ericsson, but it certainly complements its acquisition of CradlePoint, which was only a, a little over a billion dollars. And this should really serve as a nice foundation for Ericsson to hit the ground running into enterprise and be more competitive with Nokia, which in my mind has had an advantage over Ericsson with respect to private wireless, but would love to get your input. Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting because a lot of people aren't really familiar with Vonage anymore because they're not as much of a consumer company anymore. Right. Um, so I think a lot of people are questioning the, you know, the validity of this acquisition. And I think that they might be justified in some sense um, because um, this is Ericsson maybe trying to get in more into the services business mm -hmm. um, than they've traditionally been. And they've had services businesses in the past and those, ha those haven't done as well as their traditional infrastructure businesses. So, um, you know, I'm not really sure how this will work out for them. Um, but I do know that there is definitely some, you know, uh, synergy between what they're doing today and, and acquiring Vonage. Um, it just really comes to the question of whether or not they will expand um, and improve Vonage's overall reach to the point of, that it makes justified for the acquisition. I would agree with that. What's interesting, you're right, from a services perspective, it's been sort of hit or miss other than services tied to, like you mentioned, their infrastructure business. This is interesting because it could possibly open up opportunities for Ericsson to develop 5G enabled services like with video, which is what that VCP platform for Vonage potentially brings and allow Ericsson to present these capabilities to operators to find new ways to monetize that 5G investment. I've spoken in the past about how, from an LTE perspective, the operators were overly focused on access and then the whole unlimited plan shoe dropped. And the OTTs in a 4G world were really the ones that reaped the benefit of, of monetizing services. So this is interesting. Um, it's quite a costly acquisition to, you know, so to your point, um, it'll be interesting to see how this winds out. Ericsson is stating that they believe that they'll be able to uh, close the acquisition sometime late first half, early second half of next year. So we'll definitely keep our eyes and ears open and report back on future podcasts. But let's go to your first topic this week. You're at the MediaTek uh, analyst event and you wanna talk about some of the things that you learned uh, while you were there. Yeah, so uh, MediaTek had a uh, executive summit, which they didn't do last year because of the pandemic. Um, but their first one was two years ago and this is their second one. And they uh, came out swinging this, this year. Um, they announced a new Dimensity 9000, which is a flagship 5G SOC um, it does not have millimeter wave support, but it does have all of the latest cores from ARM. 
um, in terms of CPU and GPU. Um, and they are the first to support uh, DDR LP DDR5X at 7,500 uh, mega threads per second or 7,500 mega megabits per megabytes per second. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a flagship 5G SOC now. Um, they will be having um, millimeter wave support coming in a chipset announced next year, um, but that will be a mid-range chipset, uh, which I believe will most likely be something that they are targeting with an OEM for Verizon in the U.S. Um, I, I don't think that they're trying to compete at the high end on millimeter wave quite yet. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's going to be more of a mid-range or high mid-range offering. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something else that I think slipped most people um, and I actually asked this question during the Q&A, um, and I wasn't even aware of this, but apparently there are certain regions of the world where uh, TV SOCs, which MediaTek also announced, and they actually have 65% market share in TVs, um, they are going to be coming out with this new 8K 7 nanometer, um, 8, you know, 8K 120 hertz processor for TVs, mm -hmm. um, and it will... Um, enable, you know, really great experiences. But one of the things I noticed, and it was very, very minutely mentioned in the slides, was support for 5G. So, you know, people don't really talk about it, but apparently there are certain parts of the world where 5G TVs are going to be a reality. Hmm. Um, and people are going to stream their TV services over 5G. Um, so I'm very excited to see what that means long term for the market. But the important thing to remember is if MediaTek is doing it, it's very likely going to be a trend uh, simply because they have such a commanding market share of the TV market. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, I recently spoke with a, um, a provider of, uh, you know, similar solutions. And I think the opportunity from my perspective is to integrate 5G connectivity potentially on things that seem sort of mundane, like washers and dryers, because how many of us would actually spend the time, maybe you and I would, because we're technology geeks, spend the time to, to get like a white good like that on, you know, on your Wi-Fi network, other than maybe getting an alert when your dryer is, cycle is over. But I think for, you know, manufacturers, like let's say LG, putting, you know, integrating 5G into like, you know, those white good devices or a refrigerator um, provides a frictionless way for those products to be observable and, and allow, you know, vendors to potentially, you know, kind of diagnose, you know, when potentially a product's going to fail or, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and basically improve the overall sort of warranty experience. And, and that would lead to, you know, potentially, you know, loyalty and, you know, repurchase in the future. So, those and like in lots of things are going to start get connected, you know, even beyond just the cameras and the smart locks that we have in our homes. And you know, 5G is potentially a way to do that in, in a frictionless manner. So it'll um, be interesting. Yeah. I was just going to add that MediaTek also has a sizable IoT business. Mm -hmm. um, they actually power most of Amazon's um, like connected devices. So, like all the Echoes, their TVs. Um, you know, the speakers, it, it's, it's actually quite impressive. Um, mm -hmm. And they have lots of partners, vast IoT experience. There wasn't much talk about 5G IoT. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it's still very much a Wi-Fi thing. Um, okay. But I think that, you know, we should watch MediaTek and see when they start integrating 5G into their IoT platforms, because that's probably when we'll start to see it happen across the board. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting that, you know, integrating 5G into a television, if you think about folks that are, they don't have access to fiber or traditional cable, you know, in a, in a fixed wireless, you know, sort of access scenario, that could be quite interesting use case. So we'll, we'll keep tabs on this and report back as things develop. But let me speak to my second topic this week. And the CTIA organization published uh, a research report that they had commissioned uh, Accenture to do. And they're talking about fixed wireless access being a potential game changer within uh, rural America. And this is something that I've been talking about for many months, probably a year or longer. But the, the report states that basically the conclusion is FWA could serve eight and a half million rural households, nearly half in the US, 
Um, there wasn't really a time frame that was stated there, but, but certainly FWA can be an important part. There are other elements that are gonna come into play to bridge the digital divide. And so I think the timing of this report is interesting with the infrastructure bill just being passed. We've talked in the past about carve outs for broadband and that sort of thing, but would love to get your perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, the US carriers are especially gung ho on um, on fixed wireless because mm -hmm. Verizon needs to justify um, their millimeter wave build out with FWA. Um, and I think that T-Mobile is trying to justify their, you know, their massive sprint acquisition with FWA and the mid band. And to yeah. be fair, they do have a considerable amount of spectrum in that 2.5 gigahertz band. Mm -hmm. um, but I think overall, um, there has always been a significant gap in um, internet service in America, um, especially when you consider how large the U.S. is geographically. Um, I don't think there's another country remotely as large as the U.S. that's attempting to cover as much of the country as the U.S. is. Mm -hmm. um, other countries have simply just accepted that they won't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty vast undertaking. But that said, if, if we are going to cover you know, nearly 100% of Americans with 5G, um, it's going to have to be done with FWA um, as, a, as a thought to justify um, the additional costs of, of getting it out to the rural edges. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, there's going to be people who are happy with what we consider mediocre 5G just because, you know, they've been dealing with 3G or worse. Um, right. And you know, I, I think that hopefully uh, these people will get better than low low grade five G service, and will hopefully get access to at least mid band or, or millimeter wave FWA. But I, I think that millimeter wave and FWA have matured considerably um, to the point where I think we can start to offer it to people as their primary home connection. I agree. It's a potential game changer. But let's move to your second topic this week. And we've been speaking about the whole brouhaha around the FCC and the FAA and the U.S. and concerns around contention within C-band spectrum. But it sounds like this is extending up to the Great White North, right? Yeah, so Canada um, has its own organization, uh, Canada's Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, ISED. <laughs> um, and they have decided to restrict certain 5G services um, because they would interfere with radio altimeters. Um, and it's a specific restriction on anything between 3.45 and 3.65, which is mid-band. Mm -hmm. um, and it would, um, as they say, be they believe that it will interfere with the signal. And um, sorry about my dogs. Um, but, uh, you know, it would interfere with the al altimeters in that band. And as a result, um, they are banning it mid-band uh, deployment around airports, which is um, because most of the interference occurs at lower altitudes. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, um, this issue continues to come up. Um, it has been a known issue for years now, um, and it has been a problem that needed to be addressed by the FAA and the FCC, and it wasn't. Um, you and I have talked to, to a lot of people about this in the last few weeks, and I think the general consensus is this is a very edge case scenario, and this is mostly for people that do not have uh, commercial airliners. These are people who have personal small aircraft that have no filters, yeah. um, and this needs to be addressed by simply forcing these people to install filters on their planes by a certain date. Um, and it needs to be paid for by either um, the 90 billion that was raised in the US or whatever amount will be raised in Canada. Um, but this needed to be accounted for when, the, when releasing this spectrum to the operators. Um, I don't think the operators should be putting more money down for this, but I have a feeling that they, they might agree to just to, because um, I don't know if you saw, but the CTIA said um, that this delay could cost the US economy $50 billion. So um, there's definitely an issue with delaying. And I don't think it's necessary. But, um, you know, there's 
apparently that you know the aircraft community has more sway than anybody else and while i think public safety is absolutely paramount sure. um i also think that a lot of these people are flying on many decades old technology um mm -hmm. and we wouldn't allow that to occur on the roads um you know we force people to follow emission standards um, modern ones um so I, I think that you know it's it's a combination of the airline uh you know the personal airline industry not wanting to update uh, their own um, uh, equipment at their own cost and the uh, carriers being very gung-ho um, and the FAA and the FCC not planning ahead. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, I have a feeling it's very likely the same deal. Do you, do you think that we might see exclusion zones carved out in the U.S. given what's going on with C-band and you mentioned the FAA and FCC? I think there might be in the short term to ensure that um, they have some form of a rollout occur ASAP, but mm -hmm. I think those exclusion zones will likely be very short lived um, okay. because I think there will be there will be a monetary uh, settlement made where you know two or three billion dollars are set aside for these upgrades. Yeah, yeah, I would see that being probably temporary as well because. A lot of the use cases that I've seen around transportation and logistics involve airports and not only communication with aircraft, but just the ability to do really innovative things like eliminate logbooks and, and, and digitize all of that and have 5G serve as sort of a backbone for, uh, for, for airports and ports and you know, other, other facilities that are managing you know, a lot of in and out you know, with respect to um, you know, vehicles and whatnot. So, Interesting. We'll continue to keep our eyes and ears peeled to this one. But let me move to my third and final topic this week. And I want to talk about a, a proof of concept that SoftBank has launched with Honda in Japan. And what they're doing is deploying a 5G standalone network and V2X technology. And the end goal is to reduce collisions between pedestrians and vehicles. And th this seems to me like you know, a great use case to leverage the power of 5G. And certainly, you know, with cars and, you know, with the integration of cameras, you own a Tesla, more and more cars are, you know, gonna have, you know, cameras integrated and they're gonna be able to do some pretty incredible things when you harness the power of 5G from a latency and a throughput perspective. But they, they walk through several different scenarios in this proof of concept. One, reducing collisions involving pedestrians who are visible to vehicles and invisible to vehicles and actually having a communication mechanism where the car can actually send an alert to the pedestrian on their handset, sort of like an Amber alert. So I think this is a great example of the power of 5G, you know, with, you know, dynamic, you know, movement, you know, of, of people and, and vehicles and just the whole integration of, you know, camera technology. And Qualcomm's driving a lot of this with, within their digital chassis you know, program that you and I learned a little bit about last week when we were there for the uh, the investment day, but would love to get your input on it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think V2X is always going to be a really big um, opportunity for 5G, um, simply because of the safety applications. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually interested in some of the um, uh, first responder applications where, um, you know, there's going to be uh, you can actually, your, your vehicle can be aware of where a, an emergency vehicle is and the emergency vehicle is aware of traffic and lights and being able to avoid, um, you know, emergency vehicles effectively and then being able to see ahead, um, mm -hmm. you know, being able to use the front facing camera of a car at, an, at a stoplight um, or being able to just avoid um, pedestrians in general, obviously is huge. Um, I just think that, um, it's going to be a long time because the automotive industry moves slowly. Sure. Um, and while it is part of the um, 5G standard, um, you know, I think it will take some time for it to be implemented. Uh, and I, I think it, it, it'll need to be also governments that will have to adopt it as well. Um, and that has also been slow. So I think we're still quite a ways out, but there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, allow for platooning and for you know improving the speed of vehicles to hit optimal you know speeds to reduce traffic 
right. all kinds of things. So um, I, I'm very excited about it, but I'm also very realistic that it will probably take a long time. Yeah, likely, but uh, it's it's certainly exciting technology. And like you said, the safety implications are incredible. And I've been reading, and I'm sure you have as well, some of uh, the considerations that are going into installing technology in cars to prevent people from driving a car after they're over the legal limit from an alcohol perspective. And certainly this is kind of, it takes that safety to the next level. So it'll be interesting to, to see how you know things unwind here. But uh, let's move to your third and final topic this week. And you want to talk about a new set of AR glasses. You know, you are a resident AR VR guy. So what's that all about? So um, these are actually glasses that have been around for a while, um, but they've never been available in the U.S. officially. Okay. Um, so they've actually been around for about a year now, um, but now Enreal, um, which is a very close partner uh, with Qualcomm, actually, um, has launched their $600 uh, AR glasses, which they're now calling mixed reality glasses, um, even though they're very much AR glasses. Uh, and they will be uh, available on Verizon starting December 2nd, um, actually November 30th, and then online December 2nd. Okay. Um, and you'll be able to purchase these and they can be compatible with uh, Samsung and OnePlus phones. Um, so you don't necessarily have to uh, one own one specific device, uh, which is what the case used to be last year when you when these came out. Um, so there's a plethora of Samsung devices, including the entire S21 and S20 lineup, um, as well as the OnePlus 8 uh, 5G, which is interesting because the OnePlus 9 is not on this list. Um, Nonetheless, uh, it's a big deal because this is a consumer AR headset that you can finally get in the US. Um, the only issue is you, if you have an iOS device, uh, you're out of luck. Um, so compatibility is still not quite, quite where it needs to be, but I actually don't really see um, there being AR devices in the future that will be compatible with Apple um, until Apple launches their own. So um, mm -hmm. I think Apple wants to be first to market on iOS. Um, and that's just going to be the way it is. But eventually I see there being a possibility that other AR, AR glasses will be allowed onto Apple's platform. But at this point, there is no Apple platform, so yeah. we can't even talk about it. Um, but overall, this is a great um, addition to Verizon's lineup. Uh, and I'm not surprised that Verizon is the one doing it. Um, but I am going to say that I have a feeling that Verizon um, probably competed with T-Mobile for this. Um, because T-Mobile uh, Germany in Deutsche Telekom has a pretty good relationship with OnePlus. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had some kind of discussions with T-Mobile US because they're also very engaged on XR and AR and VR. Um, mm -hmm. So I was a little surprised to hear it was Verizon, but I'm also not really because um, they do want to show off millimeter waves capabilities. Um, yeah. And the best way to do that is uh, having an AR headset. Absolutely. It's a great use case for sure. And as you mentioned, that's been Verizon's emphasis is building out its millimeter wave, you know, ultra wideband service. So, well, awesome, Betty. This has been another great podcast. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide us insights on a specific 5G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Whaletown Tech and I'm at Anshul Sag. We hope you have a great Thanksgiving and please tune in again next week.